I remember that she gave me my first air check as a presenter. And that air check changed my life. Oh, there you go. There's the curveball moment. There you go, right there. I didn't realise. There it is. That air check changed my life. It's true. The king of broadcasting, Richard Feidler. His early days in comedy and TV, his rise to radio's top job, the time he set himself quite literally on fire, and why he says he was struck by a lightning bolt the day he met his wife. Rarely is Richard so revealing, and it's all here, coming up on Curveball. If Richard Feidler were a guest on the hit podcast Conversations instead of its host, he'd probably take up about five episodes. He's been a musician slash comedian, he's been a TV host, a radio presenter, a podcast host, and of course, an author. But he didn't mastermind this Renaissance man trajectory. In fact, before any of these careers even started, he wasn't sure he'd have one at all. He thought a nuclear holocaust was going to take us all out. And his path to the pinnacle of podcasting wasn't necessarily a smooth one either. But even a life-threatening accident has its upside. If Richard wasn't forced to lie in the hospital for nights on end with nothing to do but listen, would he have found his podcasting heroes? So how did Richard go from an upstart punk to one of Australia's most respected media personalities? Richard Feidler, welcome to Curveball. Oh my God, I yeah, I don't like myself hearing that <laughs> introduction. I think, oh, I don't want to hear that, hear from that man. No, no. You're a cat with nine lives. You've done so much. Of course, before conversations, before your TV work, before all of these amazing history books that you've written, you were an art student at the Australian National University. University in Canberra, which hardly seems like the most interesting place to grow up. Oh, well, I didn't grow up there. I just went to uni there. I'd sort of grown up all over the place in Sydney and Melbourne and and Adelaide. I had my high school years in Adelaide. Then my family moved to Canberra and I went to ANU. So that I went to ANU because it was the Canberra University, apart from the other one that was up the road. That it was that actually, no one's heard of. The, yeah, the Canberra <laughs> University now, but it was it's actually a College of Advanced Education pretending to be a university. But anyway, so <laughs> I, yeah, I went to ANU and I did an arts degree. And the reason why I did an arts degree, I think, was because I had no idea what to do. I'd, I'd graduated from high school, hadn't got – I think my dad wanted me to do law, didn't quite get the marks to get into law – didn't know what I wanted to do at all. I finished, I, I, because Adelaide had five years of high, sc- high school in those days rather than six, I was younger than anyone else and quite a bit more immature. I had no idea what to do with my life. So an arts degree was a way of looking occupied uh, that looked vaguely respectable, I think, and also allowed me to sort of daydream a lot. So that was that was the obvious thing to do. It's something I've encouraged my young kids to do, to do arts degrees as well, because I don't think you know what you want to do. Very no. few people are, are vocationally directed in their late teens. And, you know, how many people do you know completely change the course of their life at the age of 30 once they'd done the law degree, the medicine degree, and... The world of literature, the world of comedy is full of ex-lawyers, Kelly. And uh, so I'm, I'm, in, in a way, I'm very glad that I took skipped the time, that skipped that part and took the time to do an arts degree. And it's interesting to me that, you know, Canberra was this place, you know, probably quite sleepy then, not particularly interesting, but that breeds something, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It, it wasn't at all sleepy for me and for my friends. Canberra was a small city, much smaller than it is now. This is the early 80s we're talking about now. Uh, an ideology arrived, which was punk rock, which was like you make your own fun. A- apathy is pathetic and there's no excuse for it. So don't walk around going, mm, there's no way to go. Start your own place. Uh, go and do something. Make Start a band. Start a theatre company. Form a busking group. Find a place to perform. Find a place to write things. Find a place to do things. Do it yourself. And there was a big do-it-yourself ideology. And the aesthetics of Canberra sort of gave – lent strength to that because – Canberra wasn't as pretty uh, then as it is now. It, it was full of bleak and alienating architecture. And so a lot of that allowed us, people at the time, my age anyway, to plug into the kind of post-punk music that was coming out of Britain and in the north of England at the time, like you know, bands like Joy Division and Killing Joke, which made a lot of sense and sounded like a soundtrack to our own lives. 
Um, that made perfect sense at the time. So culturally, it was really vibrant. The, the counterculture, as it was then, because there was still a counterculture because there was no internet, meant that it, all this do-it-yourself, make-your-own-fun ideology gave real purpose and direction and energy to people's lives. So everyone go. it's always hard to persuade this to people, persuade people who've never lived in Canberra of this. I was never bored in Canberra. There was always something to do, always some new friends to make, to, uh, uh, to combine with and collaborate with. And the threshold of getting to an audience there is really low and easy. And I find it interesting that you say apathy was no excuse because you didn't really see a future for yourself at the time, did you? No, I didn't. That was the other side of it. Um, these were kind of bleak times as well. Not many people really remember this, but the early 80s were a time when the power of the Cold War was really, really strongly reignited. The United States had a new president, Ronald Reagan. The Soviet Union had a ageing geriatric leadership under Leonid, Leonid Brezhnev. The reaction time to a nuclear attack had shrunk to something like six or 15 seconds or a minute. I can't even remember what it was. And there were stories that would be that you'd hear like no rat in the United States had seen a flock of geese across its screens and was like seconds away from launching a major retaliatory attack on the Soviet Union. And now, and now, in the benefit of hindsight, we know it was even worse than that. Actually, mm. there was there were several moments where both sides came close to a, a terrified uh, nuclear uh, holocaust. Uh, I was in part of conversations in the refectory in the uni bar in, at ANU. Who would, where we knew there would be a nuclear winter. That was the thing that came through at the time. Like the, Australia wouldn't escape it, that the world, the, too many of the, the world's forests would burn, there'd be a shroud over the earth, the world's crops would die, and we'd just take a lot longer to die in Australia after a new, nuclear holocaust. That was the conventional wisdom at the time. I didn't think I'd live to see 30. My dad told me otherwise, but I, I, I didn't think I'd live to see 30. And so you might as well get it, tear it up, start something, do something. Don't sit there cowering in the corner. So you came up with uh, two other people, Paul, of course, and Tim, Paul McDermott, Tim Ferguson, to start the Doug Anthony All-Stars. And looking back at it, you know, I watched a few clips recently. It's this eclectic mix of so many things. Like what I'm interested in what you were trying to do or the medium you were trying to own, because to me it had so many elements of so many different things. We were interested in so many different things. Paul was an art school student in those days. He was doing astonishingly great, wonderful work in the Canberra School of Art in those days. Uh, I was an art student. Tim was a kind of a jobbing actor in, in those days. And we had a kind of a massive cultural interest that had been built up over time as nerdy boys, you know, and we began as a busking group in Civic in Canberra. And that was a that was a kind of like a doorway that, I, that allowed us to do a lot of different things. From being a busking group, we became a stage act. Uh, we started creating our own shows. Uh, we created our own play called The Club of Dresden at one point, which um, Canberra people might remember. I don't know. And we wrote original songs for it, created our own artwork and posters for it because, because uh, we had – I was, an, I was doing graphic art as well as Paul, so we both make posters for, for things. We wrote songs, and Tim was a, piano, a pianist. So we were always creating art and music and comedy and just saw it as a way of, uh, a way of performing a total cultural assault as we saw it in, our, in that time. The thing that strikes me about that, knowing you now as well as I do, is – how disciplined you were then. You were all young, yeah, early really 20s. Really hard working. Really yeah, hard working, yeah. which has seen all of you onto such amazing careers. Yeah, yeah we're very hard working. Yeah. Do you think that that bred in you a sense that you could go somewhere with this group? How, how did the Doug Anthony All Stars get from Civic to, you know, the stages of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival? Well, I think we started, I remember there were some shows we did in Canberra early on, and they went over so well. Tim, I remember Tim saying to me, we've got something here. I think we actually have something here. And Paul wasn't a member of the group in that stage. We had another guy, Rob, 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 Robert Piper, and Rob left to go and live overseas, and Paul joined. I met Paul through a cabaret venue in Canberra, and he joined us. And, and Paul was his own kind of fireball of creativity. And that's when things really, really took off. And Paul had that beautiful tenor voice as well, that gorgeous voice. So the three of us together, were, we, people said there was a kind of incredible energy there that – came out of that collaboration. We knew within a year of forming we had something that we could absolutely, absolutely take to the whole world. And that was insanely ambitious. We didn't know how to do it, but we knew we'd have to get out of Canberra <laughs> to do it though, <laughs> Kelly. We absolutely did, but we were quite certain of it. I don't know, when you have a thing like that, you, it's like a star you follow. 
and we were all following that star. And we did it for 10 years. And after 10 years, I really wanted to kill that star and actually put a knife through the heart of that star. I know that's a mixed metaphor, but there you go. <laughs> you used to play in some wacky places, though. Like you would do encores in all sorts of strange places. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We had this. This is my idea. I, I can take credit for this. We were playing in a pub called the Prince Patrick Hotel in Melbourne after we moved to Melbourne. And we just got this idea that we'd take the audience and shove them all into the women's toilets for our encore. Just shove everyone in there, regardless who was in there doing a wee at the time, Kelly. And there'd probably be some terrified person in the cubicle while a uh, hundred or so people were crammed in the in the toilet sitting on the sink and singing with us and performing. Then we took them into the, the, the median strip in the middle of Victoria Parade outside the pub and had them and stopping traffic. people with you? Oh, yeah, 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 people absolutely would. We did. We often did that in shows in London. Um, we, we did a theatre season in London. We took the audience at Christmas time right outside the Bloomsbury Theatre into Euston Station, where we, we performed in there at about eleven o'clock at night, and we did it around a homeless person who was sleeping inside the station and who was pretty out of it and didn't wake up during the whole performance. But we asked the audience members to put like you know pound coins into this guy's sleeping Aww. bag, so he would have woken up. So These good. magical riches, which was nice. Yes, it was. A, it was a lot of fun. What made you all decide to go overseas? And that is really where it really took off. You were on, you know, BBC specials, Channel Four. You ended up with your own show on the ABC. What made you head overseas? We, yeah, we were we were successful in Britain before Australia. We went to we'd moved to Melbourne after we'd finished our degrees. Paul and I, the three of us, moved to Melbourne, and we found we struggled there a bit. There was a sense of a hierarchy. Not amongst the performers themselves. The comedy scene was booming in Melbourne at the time. But there was a sense that, oh, no, you guys are new arrivals. You're from Canberra. You have to pay your dues. And I thought, oh, please, pay your dues. Oh, really? So I got kind of – we got really frustrated by that. And we knew another Australian act called Los Trios Ringbarkas had gone to Edinburgh in the early 80s and won the Best of the Fringe Award. And I, I think that's what inspired us. So we got on a plane in 1987, arrived in London – started busking the day we arrived in Covent Garden. I remember we made about 158 quid that day from one day's busking. That was pretty good in, yeah, the, in those really days. Good, yeah, it was really good, really good. And we yeah. thought, and that was a great relief. We thought, well, whatever happens, we can make a living busking while we're here. Then we went up to Edinburgh and straight away started performing everywhere we could in every single venue we could find. And by the end of that festival, we were the most talked about act on the whole of the Edinburgh Fringe and we were the only Australian act that year in Edinburgh. So then we took that to London. Then we got a gig on a show called Friday Night Live, which was like the prototype of the big gig, hosted by Ben Elton. Wow. Uh, we went on that. The, that was six months after that. We flew back to the UK for that. That played to a gigantic national British audience. And then we came back again to the Edinburgh Fridge, and we were even bigger that year after that, and that, that made us. When we did that Friday Night Live show – Wendy Harmer was on the same show with us. Really? And did you know her then? Oh, yeah, we knew Wendy. Paul, was, Paul had shared a house, a group house with her in Fitzroy. And when Wendy got back, she contacted Ted Robinson at the ABC, who she'd done the Gillies Report with, and she said, I want to host a show like this in Australia. And Ted watched the video and he went, who are those guys? <laughs> Where are they from? Oh, from Melbourne. So, so that's how we got on the big gig. Amazing. This time in Europe and in the UK ends up being quite pivotal for a young Richard Feidler because you're such a history nerd and this offers you a time to travel and explore the world. And of course, the late 80s is an incredible time to be in Europe. What, yeah. what did you see? What did you experience? I, I, was, I was a big reader of modern history. And uh, in 1989, when we were based in London, I was watching the former police states of Eastern and Central Europe that had been set up by Stalin at the end of the Second World War just collapsed one by one under popular revolutions. The new Soviet leader was Mikhail Gorbachev, and that, you know, he was a liberal by Russian standards, and, you know, and died, died not so long ago, and, you know, he's much missed, actually, compared to Vladimir Putin, God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so with him, the whole temperature of the Cold War just dropped away, and it started to feel like we, you know, there was, it was a much more positive vibe. And I think Poland was the first to get a democratic government. They overthrew the communists in an election. Then Hungary dismantled its borders and uh, they, they, they became democratic. Then the big one was the Berlin Wall. Oh, God, Kelly, I was doing a theatre season in London. As the Berlin Wall was coming down 
it's just over, it's just there across the water and it's this historic event and people are dancing i'd been to the berlin wall and when it was still up 2 years earlier on my first visit to europe and it it struck me as you know, fascinating and monstrous at the same time i went on both sides of the berlin wall east and west berlin and there it was coming down everyone's dancing on top of the the, the wall chipping away lumps of it so the, the moment i could my my girlfriend had flown over from um, from australia at that point and she and i went to berlin and people were still chipping away at the wall. I chip I've got a chunk of the wall at home. I chipped away myself. Oh my goodness. It was really thrilling and um <laughs> I, I don't know what kind of language restraints we have here, but, but th- there was I, I was kind of thrilled at this historic moment, Cal. I, it, it was incredible. It was just thrilling. We arrived at the wall. It was about 7 o'clock at night. And we thought, oh, let's go through to East Berlin. And But we, as far as we still had to go through Checkpoint Charlie, the, the kind of the, the, part, the, the point of passage there. And I'm walking through Checkpoint Charlie with, with Josephine and, and it's like it's very John Le Carre, you know. There's like hospital green walls, fluoro lights, communist architecture, that kind of thing. We're going through the, through the passageway there, and I hear this voice go, "Hey, Doug Anthony and his all stars, what the fuck are you doing here, mate? Oh, no. What are you doing here?" And he, then he goes, he does this to me, Kelly. He goes, "Come here, come here." Oh, no. I mean, it's like because Australians are like this. So I walked over and I went, "Yeah," and he goes, "I reckon you guys are shit ass." And he goes, "Oh, what's the matter? You up yourself? I'm gonna go away like that." No. So I, yeah, yeah. And he goes, hey, hey, "I showed him, you know." Like oh, that. we're so yeah. bad with. Um, yeah. We're just horrible, aren't we, Australians? We don't know how to deal with that stuff. <laughs> no, we're the worst at that. I think Australians. Uh, so, so the, anyway, that was this historic moment. And shortly after that, um, after we went from Berlin, we went to Prague, which was even wilder, much wilder. And, and this, of course, is part of the Velvet Revolution. Um, you know, you've got the poets. Like, this is a, a, a peaceful, artistic sort of revolution, isn't it? So every, how did that inspire you? Every time I think about that, even as you're saying it now, I feel this kind of little electric tingle of, of joy and happiness. It was the happiest place in the world to be in Prague. At the uh, we, I was, we got there in January 1990, and it was a week after... Václav Havel, who was a poet and playwright, a playwright really, uh, who had been a dissident, had spent years and years in jail. He was the new president of this democratic freed nation, freed from this police state that they'd been lumbered with for 40 years. And the whole city was in ferment. It was the most joyful explosion after years of misery and surveillance by the secret police. It was all, it was gone. And and everyone was running about. I remember it was a busy time. Everyone's like handing you a handbill written in Czech, which was then entirely impenetrable to me. And hardly anyone spoke English. I'm having to communicate people with like bad, bad tourist German, you know, that, that kind of <laughs> level of communication. But but everyone wanted to talk to me because they recognised me as an outsider and tell me what was what was going on. I joined a, a demonstration against the secret police one night. I, I was sitting in the cafe of this hotel in Winchester Square and a big parade of people were going by. And they were demonstrating. I was thinking, oh, what are they demonstrating for? You know, the revolution's been done. It's been, the Velvet Revolution has been achieved. And I went out and, and they, I was passed to someone who spoke English and said, we're, we're protesting against the STB, the secret police. And I said, but, but the regime's been defeated. Uh, why, why are you still protesting the STB? And he goes, they're still spying on people. I said, who are they reporting to? And the guy says, someone, no one, we don't know. So I joined this demonstration to the secret police headquarters um, in Bartolomeska Street in Prague. And it's this, it's this round building. It's like the colour of a bruise. It's really, it's really a frightening building, even today, to walk past. I have friends of mine who won't walk past it. Print check friends of mine who won't walk past it because it, it chills them to the bone. And down this little narrow street, there was this kind of frisson of terror. Everyone was worried the secret police had weapons caches on the roof and were going to fire into the crowd, which had just happened the week earlier in Bucharest by the secret police. So at that point, Kel, I moved to the back of the crowd a bit. Yeah, I was going to say this is. You know, I love democracy, sounding- but. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to die for Czech democracy at, at that at that moment, um, and so what, what I, when I did that, I, I was then passed off to a woman. Her name was Marta, and and she explained to me what the system was like, what it was like, how to live under that system. She said it would be like this. She said you'd be at a party, and someone would make a joke about the regime. The Czechs are great for jokes; like they they're they're hilarious people. They're they're the kind of Irish of Central Europe. They everyone's funny. Everyone's funny. So, so someone will make a joke about the regime. Then the Thursday after the party, you get a phone call from the STB. An officer would say, hi, it's us, it's the STB. We're going to send a car for you tomorrow to pick you up at 11 a.m. Uh, we want you to help us with some of our questions. It's no big deal. Don't worry. It's fine. You're not in trouble. It's okay. Okay, so nonetheless, you're worried. 
you, you get picked up the next morning, you get taken in the car to the secret police interrogation centre, and they bring you and say, calm down, it's fine, don't worry, we're just going to have a chat with you, just want to talk to you about a couple of things. You're at that party, someone made a joke, that's fine, no big deal, we all make jokes, even we make jokes, you know, we make jokes, it's not fine, but, but uh, what do you know about that person that made the joke? Oh. What's, that, what's that person's name? And, and were they serious when they made that joke? Who laughed at that joke? Here's a piece of paper. Write down the names of everyone you remember being at that party. Then they point down the list and they find a name. They go, that person there. Do they, what kind of jokes do they make? Do they, do they ever say anything that's odd about the regime? It's like about a quiet the terror. It's, it's, they shame you and they find ways to humiliate you and coerce. It's a subtle coercion, coercion process. I mean, early in the re- years of the regime, it was actually physical torture and, and often of course, death. Yeah. But, but this was a far more effective method of control. And they would then say to you, look, You've been really helpful to us in this meeting. Um, do you mind if we get in, you get in touch with us from time to time? We'll contact you just about, you know, you may be in office about with some people who are, who are against the working people of Czechoslovakia. You know, you can be a big help to us. And you get ahead in the queue for an apartment. You get ahead in the queue for a car. Your kids get to go to a better school. But if you're the person who made that joke, well, things don't go so well for you. Then you either become an informer for the regime and if you stand your ground – then you'll be seen as a person unfriendly to the working people of the nation. You find your kids can't get a high school education. And so you do it for the kids in the end. And if, it, if you stand your ground and you write a letter to the international media, as Václav Havel did, you go to prison. So I, I think that was a really important moment for me, Kelly. Um, it was also combined with the knowledge that the Cold War was over. And one of the reasons why the place was so festive and people of my age and, our, and people in our 20s were so happy was we felt we had our future given back to us. Do you think that those moments where you are right on the precipice of such incredible history, you're witnessing it, you're, you're sort of you know bearing witness to these amazing things is what drew you then to incorporate historical moments or set a lot of your books in these places, you know, the Byzantine era, Constantinople, Prague, the Icelandic stories. Is that what drew you to that sense of place in all of your books? I think I sort of stumbled on that um, when I wrote my first book, Ghost Empire, which is a kind of a uh, history of the later Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire, as some people call it, based around the city of Constantinople, which is now known as Istanbul. I based it around a journey I took there with my son when he was 14. It was kind of like a coming-of-age thing for him. We, he loves history like I do, and I wanted to show him the beginning and end of the Roman Empire. So we started at Rome and then went to Istanbul and could see the, what's there, what remains of the, this dead civilization, uh, the Hagia Sophia, the, the um, Cistern of Justinian, the, uh, uh, the Theodosian walls that used to protect the city. People don't realise there's more Roman ruins in Turkey than there are in Italy. Yeah. It's an incredible place. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly right. So uh, I, I, I sort of stumbled on that. I thought, I'd, well, I'd like to write, write a history of this because the, at, around about this time I also uh, read the story of the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the moment when the Roman Empire really died, not with the death of an emperor, a boy emperor in Italy, but with the death, uh, with the uh, invasion of the city by the Ottoman Turks in 1453, much, much, much later. Um, that, when I encountered that, I thought that was the most astonishing, th- enthralling story, the most poignant, uh, extraordinary tale I've ever read about in, in all of my reading of history. I couldn't bel- – it, it, and, and it's attested to by multiple accounts as well. So it's not just one person writing a tale of what this is what happened. There are multiple sources on what happened at that time, in August 1453. And I thought, well, why don't I make that into a narrative? And why don't I do something really ambitious and write the whole of the Byzantine history, which is crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. But then, but then base it around my journey there with my son. Author and ABC broadcaster Richard Feidler is my guest on Curveball. And Richard, your love of travel keeps recurring because not long after you finish with the Doug Anthony All-Stars, you end up working on a TV show that's all about bringing culture and places into Australian lounge rooms. That show was Race Around the World. I can't take any credit at all for, for that show. That was, um, uh, that was uh, a show that was initially done in Canada 
then completely reimagined for Australia. It was brought to Australia by a guy called Mike Rubo, but then Paige Livingston was the producer of that, and Paige was the person who turned it into, she made it this amazing, wonderful show, the show that it was, which was a very different and quite frankly, a vastly better show than the Canadian version. It was um, quite groundbreaking because it's basically reality TV before mm. reality TV's you know, kind of been invented much later with things like Big Brother, but we really were witnessing these people in real time travel. That's exactly right. I, I, I thought so when reality TV became a thing four years later with Big Brother. I thought, oh, we kind of did that first but and better, quite frankly, uh, giving these people cameras. This is when digi handicams were, uh, were, were a new thing and I, I even had to explain the technology on the first episode to show. Really? This is a like handheld mini digi cam and this is how it works because people are wondering how are these how are these young people going around the world how are they able to shoot all this and I had to explain how it worked you know the, the screen <laughs> flips open and this is it this is how you do it at the same time because it's the ABC we had to hide the Sony <laughs> The word Sony on the camera. I had to put my thumb over Sony so it didn't look like product placement or something like that. Was the goal to move into television? No, not what, at all. What were you planning to do no, after you no. finished the trio? I, I thought I, I thought I was done with all of that. I was getting involved at the time when the trio was finished. In, in fact, for a year or two at the end of the uh, lifespan of the Doug Anthony All-Stars, we were based in London. I was involved with an interactive, what was known as, remember interactive multimedia, Kelly? Get out. You yeah. were not. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got like CD-ROMs? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I've always been a graphic artist, so I was beginning involved in learning how to create digital art um, and digital animation and 3D modelling, and I was doing all of that, and I was thinking, oh, this is great, this is fun, this is a wave of the future. And I was involved in that with a company over there called New Vision Media, and they 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 sponsored me to stay in Britain and work for them, um, but because because I have no British relatives, I couldn't get a work work visa. So it was it was back in Australia, and I was getting involved in that scene, such as it was in Australia, when someone came and asked me to do a talk show uh, on the Comedy Channel called Mouthing Off, uh, and I did that with uh, with Andy Neal and Courtney Gibson, and. That was a lot of fun. It was incredibly low budget, but it was an interview show, effectively, a panel interview show. And I thought, I really enjoy this. I'm really enjoying this interviewing thing. It's, it's, it's very, very pleasurable. It allows me to be quite ranging. It allows me to be funny if I think I can be. And um, and that was great. And it was doing that that Paige Livingston spotted me and said, oh, I want you to host Race Around the World. So, so, so suddenly, without ever intending to, Kelly, I had a TV career. And I, the whole idea of having a career was frightening. A TV <laughs> career, that's appalling. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you decide to move out of TV? Your star's on the rise. You're hosting all of these shows. You're a natural in front of the camera. You love interviewing. Why make the decision to step away from television? Well, I think that decision was made for me, Kelly. I think um, TV, there's only – there are all these TV presenters in Australia and only so many shows that happen – Race Around the World, despite its success, got cancelled for whatever, for reasons I've never been able to fathom. Looking back, maybe it was a wise decision. I, 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 I think maybe if it had kept going, someone might have died on the road. It, some of those guys took insane risks, feeling the intense pressure of coming up with a mini documentary every 10 days. Um, so anyway, that was cancelled. I had another show that, that was, that was cancelled. So suddenly... There's no work. I started doing other things. I got involved in the Australian Republican movement and then I became a dad and had to, had to find an income. So then I became a manager for a while on TV, in TV comedy, and I was no good at it. I was, you know, didn't enjoy it, wasn't any good at it. We probably have skipped over the fact that during all of this you meet this wonderful woman called Kim and she's a performer on one of the shows. Tell me about the first time you met her. Well... Yeah, we were making Des Capital, this comedy series, this low-budget sci-fi comedy series. And we were kind of inspired by Robocop with that. And we wanted to set have a comedy that was set sometime in the spurious dystopian future. And and we needed a, a newsreader. And we liked the idea that the, the, uh, kind of all the cultures of the world were sort of a, it was a giant mishmash. So we, we specific, specified we wanted a Chinese woman to read the news. Woman, because... You know, it, it was very bloke heavy already with three of us. So, and it just gave, gave, kind of gave the right feel to the whole thing. And Kim was by far the person, best person who auditioned. The first moment I met her, she was in the makeup room at the ABC in Melbourne, and she had a whole lot of makeup. She was made up to look like 
you know, someone on CNN essentially. And, and she was really nice and we got on really well. And then we finished filming for the end of the day. And I remember standing outside the ABC waiting for a, waiting for a taxi to come. And Kim walked out and she'd just had all her makeup removed and she'd let her hair down. She had like waist length hair. And she, I remember she walked out and it was late afternoon and she sort of looked out and she put her face up to the sun, the sunshine. And that was it. Love at first sight happens, Kelly. Mm. It does happen. And that was absolutely it. I got, you know, that scene in The Godfather where Michael Corleone is in Sicily and the, and, you know, he, he sees the woman of his dreams and um, and he just gets the thick oh, he's got the thunderbolt, he's got the thunderbolt. I, I thought that was fanciful. No, it does happen. I've interviewed plenty of people who've had this experience too. It's, I think, about 90% of the time it's men. Mm. It's, I don't know if women get the thunderbolt. I think, I, I I don't think we're think, just more practical by yes, nature, aren't we? That's right. I think, <laughs> I think men get the thunderbolt then we pester the women <laughs> into tolerating us. So I think that's how it goes. But when you get that, when that happens to you, it's, it's, it's really frightening. It's very frightening. Suddenly you realise this person you've only just met, um, a, a whole lot of your happiness rests in that person. It's very frightening. Yeah. You go on to have two beautiful children, Joe and Emma, and it- – Mostly because of the family. You have a young family. You're living in Sydney where nothing's affordable, you know, works hard. You can't even get into the property market. You make quite a brave decision to move north. Yes. Yes. I had been doing some radio, uh, uh, doing some ABC radio. Winnie McLeod, who was an amazing person, who who is so modest and self-effacing. She, she, I don't know, there ought to be a statue for her in the ABC. She's an extraordinary person. You know, she was there in the early days of Double J. She set up Life Matters, which when it was called Offspring on Radio National. She's been involved in – she was the head of network local radio for a long while. Uh, an amazing person. Uh, she rang me up one day and just said, do you want to fill in on Nightlife when Tony Dilroy was doing the show regularly, which is the ABC's late night show around Australia between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. as it was then. I said, I'd love to. And – and I started doing it. I remember it was, she gave me my first air check as a presenter and that air check changed my life. Oh, there you go. There's the curveball moment. There you go, right there. <laughs> I didn't realise. There it is. That air check changed my life. It's true. Okay, we need to drill into this. So for people listening, an air check is the process whereby the expert in radio, the manager of the radio station, sits down with the presenter and says, Richard, let's listen to the tape of your show from last night and let's look at you know what's working really well, what you can do differently, how you need to improve. Now, I've done this process with you, you, you have. but I've also done it with many, many presenters, most of whom find it very difficult. Most of them find it confronting. They have imposter syndrome. They don't think they should be behind the mm. microphone. What was it that Wendy did that was so wonderfully life-changing for you? She helped me completely dismantle a media personality I'd constructed and wasn't happy with. It was a TV media personality I constructed to be a television presenter, which was to sort of be, um, I suppose, trying to be charming, uh, maybe trying to be funny, trying to be a smart ass here and there, which was a bit of a struggle. You know, uh, it wasn't it wasn't who I really am. Yeah, and you're not naturally snarky, but no. that's sort of the role. Even in in Doug Anthony All Stars, you kind of had to play a little. A little. It's it's kind of a Gen X disease, I think, to live in irony land all the time, where you don't ever quite say what you're thinking, what you're feeling about things. And so Wendy just heard me all the affectations I had as a presenter. Um, like the first thing I remember, the first thing she ever said to me was like when when it, the first line was wrong. I went, I went on air after the news. I went, "This is Richard Feidler," and she went. Oh, have you ever said this is Richard Feidler in real life? And I said, no. Yeah. Do you go to parties <laughs> yeah, and go, walk in and say, this is Richard this is Feidler? Richard Feidler. It's 25 degrees outside. Um, <laughs> let's, let's catch up with the traffic. Uh, no. And I went, oh. And she just she just heard me when I was having closed conversations with guests. And she said, can you hear how you're leaving out the listener here? And I absolutely could. I, I absolutely could. And she did it in such a gentle way, She in a really kind way. And I just heard it all. And that allowed me to stop trying to pretend to be this person, to wear, and also to wear that thing that Ira Glass calls the mask of omniscience, where you act like you know everything anyway, which is, which is of course, absurd and it can never be true. 
and it's really irritating for listeners to hear it. Absolutely. Um, so uh, she she helped me just find a place where I could actually be much more natural. And you know, when things go wrong, you go, "Well, that didn't work, did it?" You know that that, that that's so much so much better way of of going about being a presenter in radio to stress the importance of being a companion to listeners. So you're headed to Brisbane, you're working on local radio in Brisbane, and we start a state-based show back then. It was only going out in Queensland in, I think, 2005 called Conversations. That's right. What do you think made that show work almost from the get-go? Well, if we're going to be really candid, Kelly, you should be the person to answer that question because <laughs> oh, you were no. my producer on that show. I was, but you I were. don't think I can claim the credit well, for the I'm success. Well, uh, I'm going to quote my producer at the time whose name was Kay Reardon <laughs> um, of what you told me, and it was very, very good. What you said to me was, this show specialises in talking to people who are unknown to the wider community who have seen and done amazing things. And you said listeners always, well, nearly always respond to those people, those unknown, interesting people, much more than they respond to the powerful and the famous and the fabulous. And your line was, and I've never forgotten this, Kelly, was because listeners can measure their own lives against them more successfully. And that's so true. There's such wisdom in that. Yeah, I just very early on thought, you know, and you'd get this, the great thing about working at the ABC, you've got a switchboard. People ring you and they tell you what they think. And I just noticed that those ordinary people who'd done extraordinary things just struck a chord. And we could have the famous actor and the famous musician on, and that was great. It was always a rollicking good time. But people just love other people's real stories. And I think it gets back to that authenticity, which I think is hugely powerful in radio and audio medium in a way that it's not for television and, and print and other media forms, I think. Yeah, and I think the super famous often regulate the amount of energy they're going to give you. And why wouldn't they? I mean, everyone's pestering to know what, what they really think, what they like, really like and what their lives, private lives are really like. So they, they often, they're careful about how they talk to you. You know, movie stars are really boring people, Kelly. This is the, <laughs> this is the truth. I know, I know how that, I know how, how it is to shoot, you know, television and movies you know, what the, you know what your life is if you're a movie star most of the time? So you get up at dawn, you arrive on the set, you get made up, and then you wait in your trailer for five hours before they're ready for you and you play video games. You're, not, you're not hanging around in Prague <laughs> no. when there's a, a quiet revolution going on all around you, right? No, you're not doing any of that. You're not going out and about in the world. You're living this strange cloistered existence. It's really quite boring. So often they don't really have much to report outside of the parties they go to and the latest person they're having sex with. So, so there's really not that much there when you talk to movie stars. And the great and wonderful exception to that was the late Angela Lansbury. She was the by far a million miles the most interesting movie star. She's the, she's the exception that proved the rule for me. I, I loved uh, re-listening to that interview recently when uh, it was played on Conversations, obviously, because she's just passed. And she was so generous, wasn't she? How many people has she spoken to in her career? And she just still brought something to that interview. And I'll, I'll tell you why. I did a lot of research on her before I interviewed her. I, I, I found, I tracked down a lot of interviews with her that she'd done, and I realised this amazing woman who had been in Gaslight way back in the 1940s, oh she'd been in the movie Gaslight, and she'd been in Blue Hawaii with Elvis. She was really the star of The Manchurian Candidate, an extraordinary film, perhaps her greatest film role. She'd been a musical comedy, uh, a musical star with Mame. She's the voice of that. She's one of the great characters in Beauty and the Beast, the Disney animated version of that. And then she's done Murder, She Wrote. She's done all these things. And no one had given her a proper interview. No one. I heard her on with Larry King, and he spoke for more for longer than she did. And I'm sorry, he's an incredibly boring man. Hey, dude with the braces, <laughs> pipe down for a second. Let the interesting lady talk, national okay? National treasure on the air here. Yeah. Give us some space. Yeah, and it's not you, buddy. You're not the national treasure. And very much my philosophy has been to keep my mouth shut as an interviewer, which is why it feels really odd sort of blabbing on here with you, Kelly. <laughs> uh, but, most, but to keep my mouth shut and give people the space to talk. And at the end of the interview, I, well, the, the, the beginning and the end of the interview were my favourite parts. The beginning, she, Angela could remember what it was like as a little girl, as, as a child in London in the 1930s, and she completely evoked it. Living around Maryland in 19, 1930s London, pre-war London, she, she said, and, and there was the coal man coming around going, coal, coal, and I, right straight away I was going, oh, my God, <laughs> this is wonderful. This is just beautiful. 
And at the end of the interview, it's really weird. If you listen to it, I thank her for joining me, and she says nothing. And the reason why she says nothing is there were tears streaming down her face because no one had interviewed her properly before. And she, instead of saying thank you to me, she's just put down her headphones, stepped up and reached across the console and just held my hand. And it was, and I was, I was, I was, starting, to, I was starting to cry as well. It was lovely. It was one of the most enthralling and rewarding interviews I've ever done, Kelly. I want to come to the fact that this juggernaut of a radio show becomes a podcast, but I want to take a slight sidestep because it, it, it kind of leads you there, which is that some years ago now you were in quite a scary accident at home in your kitchen. Yes. What happened? Well, it was my birthday. That's that's one thing. <laughs> well, that was scary. That was scary already. Itself. All birthdays are scarier and scarier as they go on. Um, it was my birthday and... Our kids were, how old were our kids then? About, I don't know, nine and 12, I think, maybe younger. We're all sitting, the four of us are sitting around the table. Kim is an amazing cook. She's an extraordinary cook. And she made a dish we all really liked. And here's a clue for the coming disaster. The dish is called bonfire beef. And, and the way you make it, right, to see how you make it, it's cooked at the table. You have a saucer and uh, you have a bowl with the ingredients, like the sliced uh, beef, ginger, lemongrass, set chili, etc., etc., And that sits on a saucer of fuel, like spirits. And you light the spirits and it slowly cooks the ceramic, what's in the ceramic dish. And it had all gone very well. We'd had one round of it and it had all been very much enjoyed. And Joe and I were still hungry. And Kim said, oh, we'll do another round and I'll just have to add a little more extra fuel to the saucer. Now, at that moment, something really weird happened, which was Emma, our little girl, said, oh, this is making me nervous. I'm stepping away from the table. Oh, my God. And she stepped all the way back and stepped all the way back to the door, the front door of the house. And Kim just got a little cap full of, of spirits and just tipped it into the, the saucer. That's all. And whew, there was this giant fireball. How? We, we now know, well, I've been told, don't add cold spirits to hot spirits. <sighs> it created a reaction. And it spattered and the fireball, um, my, I looked down and my shirt was on fire um, and the fireball barely singed the, the hair, my son Joe's hair, which is now a thing I can hardly even bear to think about. Um, and I stood up from the table and, and I, I, was, I was saying things like, oh, I'm on fire, I'm on fire, stating the obvious, you know. And I didn't do the smart thing, which was to drop the ground and roll, oh. although I don't think that would have helped me, to be honest, now that I think about it. Um, I, was, I was actually just tearing the shirt off my chest, like t- ripping it off. I stomped on it, and then Kim was desperately trying to put the, the curtains on fire, and she was trying to put them, that out, throwing water on that. And I did do the right thing, which was to run straight into the bathroom and stand under a cold shower. And... I could hear all this mayhem going on in the living room and I was I stood up and I looked and the, the skin on my uh, f- right forearm was was charred, you know, badly charred. It looked really bad. And the skin across the front of my fingers was, was similarly charred. And I looked at that and the first thing I thought was, this is bad but I'm not going to die. What, and, and then I thought, what about my family? And I started shouting out, from under the shower, are the kids all right? Are the kids all right? Are the kids all right? I was getting no answer because Kim's trying to frantically put it in the fire. Are they okay? Are they okay? Are they okay? And I, this awful and this awful pain was coming through my, my arm at this point. And and eventually Kim said, yes, yes, they're fine, as she's trying to put the fire out. They're fine, they're fine. They're fine, they're fine. They're fine. And then something, this is a really strange thing, Kelly, so this, the, the nature of the pain changed. The pain was terrible, but it didn't hurt didn't hurt as much. Uh, that's a funny thing to say. So, so when you're on fire, like you're literally on fire. Front of my shirt was on fire, yeah. Is that painful? No. But then once your body, I guess, and your nerves realise what's going on and you're in the shower, then what does it feel like? It, it, sort, of, it sort of comes up. It's, almost, it's, something, it's like something surfacing from underwater. It's just sort of, it sort of comes to the surface. My, even though my shirt caught fire, my, the front of my body, my, my chest and torso weren't, weren't burnt at all. 
Um, and, and the reason why the skin of my arms was burnt was because I think the fuel spattered onto that, the burning fuel spattered into it and just cut right into my skin. And um, that was where the, the damage was done. And, and so I have I had very badly burned skin up, up in my forearm, up my arm and under my right arm and across my fingertips. Um, but but the, like I said, the pain was sort of starting to surface. Um, but it, once I knew the kids were okay and that I wasn't going to die, it was all right. It's a funny thing to say, but it was kind of a, a sort of okay. I could stand under the shower and I could bear the pain and I just was waiting for the ambulance to come. And the ambulance came and the, uh, the paramedics came. I think they were there pretty quickly. They gave me this um, – I, my memory gets a bit vague at this point, but they gave me a ton of morphine through my foot. Oh. Um, and they were saying, how's that now? Is that helping your pain? It wasn't helping the pain. It wasn't helping. It was really? The pain was still there, yeah. Uh-oh. They gave me more morphine than a third. And they said, all right, well, that, that's all we can give you now. We're going to take you into hospital. And in the ambulance, the, the morphine started to kick in a little bit. And then I waited for what I thought was an hour or maybe, I don't know, who knows, in the Royal Brisbane Hospital and they were – this wonderful paramedic sat next to me. I, I wish I'd rem- I should have taken her name. If I did, I've forgotten, and I feel bad about that. She she kept handing me a face cloth, a cool face cloth for my fingers, which is where the pain was. It was really bad. A doctor came and saw me, bandaged me up, put antiseptic cream on me. Um, they have to wait a few days for that to settle down. And I was I think I was given more morphine at that point, and then I was fine. Like then, I, you see, I'm, I'm not a drug person, Kelly. I've never taken anything like that. And I went, oh, okay, this morphine thing. That's what. That's why people are, you know, that's why they like it. And um, it, it suddenly felt very zen. It was really odd. I felt like I was in a temple and someone was ringing chimes or something like that. And nurses were coming by. It's hard to sleep when you have morphine. That's a funny thing. Nurses were coming by saying, you okay? And, I, and I'd go, I'd smile and go, yes, I'm fine. Thank you very much. I'm fine. I'm fine. Like that. It's really <laughs> I've weird. I've literally been a fireball an yeah. hour ago, but sure, I'm fine. Anyway, three days. Uh, then I, I felt like I'd survived this near-death experience um, and I was – Quite, quite chipper for a couple of days. Then they looked at the burns and said, the time when the doctor came around and he, and he unbound, did my bandages and looked at the, the skin on my arm and he, and he said, is that hurting when I poke it like that? And I said, no, it's fine. And he goes, mate, that's not a good thing. So, yeah. yeah you're, you can't feel it, no. basically. So I had to have major skin grafts. I had to have a whole lot of skin taken from my thigh. And after oh, three hours of surgery, they put it on my arm, and it's still today. You can see it here. It's, it doesn't yeah. look too bad. It's I'm like a, cro- a sort of. A, it looks like you've been lying against something that's left an imprint on your arm. Yeah, because when they, without being too gruesome about it, when they when they take the skin from the donor site, they stretch it out, and, and they texture it so they can see what's what's the graft and what's not. So it's slightly textured <laughs> on one side, but you know. It's been a long while since I've been pretty in a bathing suit, Kelly, so I'm not too fast, you know. Yeah, you wore um, one of those skin suits for a while, yeah. I can recall. Um, and the other thing, though, is that you did spend some time in hospital and you were lying in the dark and often you have to distract yourself from the pain or the nurses coming in and out. And this is a time where you start listening more and more to podcasts. I think I'd already been a big podcast listener at that point. I think I'd started listening to podcasts – Intensely, um, some for a couple of a couple of years up to that point, I'd been over to the United States on a Churchill Fellowship. The just before I think just before I gotten burnt, um, I'd spent um, a couple of months in New York, and I, as part of my Churchill Fellowship, which was to look at new forms of public radio, um, which was very generous. I went to uh, uh, the people of This American Life, and I met Ira Glass. Went at the office, and I interviewed Ira Glass, and. And he was lovely. He couldn't have been lovelier, actually, to be honest. He was such a lovely man. He was just ter- tremendous. And we were so much on the same page, same ideology, same approach to to as a broadcaster slash podcaster. And he gave me this, what was kind of innovative then, which was a USB thumb drive full of, uh, I think it's about like 40, 40 episodes of This American Life. And like I say, when you're on tons of painkillers, it's, it's quite hard to sleep. You've got a lot of silly mental chatter. So I, w- I was putting myself to sleep by listening to episode after episode of This American Life that I'd sort of, I'd, I'd sort of listen to and then fall asleep and then come back up to and with this kind of rising and falling consciousness. And, and I think that changed the whole way I do what I do. What would you say the single greatest thing that you learned from listening to that or something that you took into your interviewing which wasn't part of your process before? I mentioned earlier what Ira said about dropping the mask of omniscience. 
stop pretending you know what the story is before you even introduce it. And it's a bad habit a lot of broadcasters have. I don't know if I had it too much. I think you and other people might have whacked that out of my head already, but he, he really put his finger on that. That moment when you hear a, a broadcaster say, and the BBC does this a lot, unfortunately, they say, um, Kelly Reed, and you make this podcast, you've been doing this for some years now. Yes. And yes, that's right. The answer to that There's question no is- There's no other answer. Because it's not even a question. <laughs> no, it's a closed it, question. It, because, because really what you're betraying as a presenter is the anxiety, your own anxieties that you're going to be called stupid or not knowing. I want you to show you, I want to show you I've done all my research yes. and I know all the facts about you and I can give you a Wikipedia biography of everything you've ever done. That's right. That's Biggest right. mistake you can make as it, a broadcaster. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's so boring. So it's boring for the listener. If you act like you know everything already, then- <laughs> You you sort of you're not open to discovery, to and humor, surprise. surprise. You go what? You know that thing where you hear things. Oh, I said a few things today, even though we've known each other for a long while, which I think I've genuinely surprised you with. Absolutely, and, and, and you can hear it, and and that's a natural human reaction. And to pretend that we know everything already because we work for the BBC or the ABC or whatever, um, it's preposterous and it's too much of a burden to carry. And I think Wendy, Wendy McLeod was another person that kicked that out of me as well, trying to sound like I was on top of everything already. How boring. What a lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, you know, Kim and the kids being there at this moment um, – you know, and you've been married now 30-something years, I think. Yes, Your beautiful years. children are now at university, or yeah. Joe is, and Emma's soon to be there, is she? She's there. She's taking a break for a little bit, though. And, you know, that's a that's a fabulous, um, you know, marriage and, and family. Has that changed you in some way? Oh, very much, completely and totally. In every, in every possible way, it is possible to be changed. Meeting, getting, being, um, meeting Kim, being with her, and then having kids, That's they're the most profound changes I've ever um, gone through as a human being. How? Well, I think first of all, this is a, this might be really annoying for some people to hear because not everyone has the same experience as this, and it's really no one really wants to hear when you no one not no one, but it, it can sometimes be annoying and can sound a little smug if you think that, say things like this. But I'm one of those people who likes being married. I know it doesn't suit everyone, but I like being married, and I know I married the right person. So that I'm very fortunate. That I, I'm aware of how fortunate I am. I really am. I know it doesn't happen to everyone. Maybe I don't know. So meeting her, she's a bit of a wise old egg, Kim. She really is. I don't think I really knew a lot about people. Not really until I met Kim. She she's a very astute observer of people, and a generous one too. And I don't think. I'd be any good as a presenter, as a radio host or a host of a show like Conversations if I hadn't found out a lot about people from having met Kim. I've also, you know, marriage also, is also a thing that helped bring, just bring some stability to my life as well. I don't, I, I don't really, don't think I really much in, I think I, for a long while I enjoyed being a single person quite a lot. I enjoyed sort of living in my own little world, but I'm glad I was rescued from living in my own little world after a while. So there's that. And then there's parenthood, which I think changes you even more profoundly, I think. I mean, you're, you're, this is, again, not, every, not everyone's a parent I know. Not everyone needs kids to be happy. I understand all that, but I'm just talking about myself here. Yeah. I'm just talking about myself here. When you know you're going to have a baby, when I say we, I'm not carrying it, I know, <laughs> I know, but I am about to become a parent. When you do this, you, you both, you know that this a wonderful thing is happening. You know that there's this person that's about to come into your life and they're going to change your life. You don't know who they are. You have no idea who they are. You have this kind of image in your head of a baby outline with an X in the middle. Person X is about to come into our lives and, and change us profoundly. And we're also told to expect a flood of love at the moment of birth, which quite frankly sounds like witchcraft. I mean, it just sounds, it just sounds preposterous. But, but you know, this is what happened. This is what happened. Um, the birth of Joe was a real ordeal for poor old Kim. I'm tall. She's quite tiny. Um, Joe didn't make it easy uh, coming into the world. But when he did, oh, my God, it's, it's just a, it, I, I think I'll ever be the same person. That, I, I see that as a kind of a dividing line in my life. The, the arrival of my kids it just leaves, you as a, it leaves me a very different person, I think. It's funny because I think it's also – the first time in your marriage where you sort of feel like, okay, 
it's you and me against the world now. Like we are now responsible for this human being and you sort of muscle in together on all the trials and tribulations that kind of come next and yes. you just become this little unit. You perform a cons- you form a conspiracy against you your children. <laughs> Where you go, okay, let's get our lines straight. When she wants something she shouldn't have, we have to be on the same page with this, all right? Yes, you do. And the other thing is fatherhood. Um, When you become a father, uh, uh, quite rightly, of course, after the child is born, so much of the attention is absolutely correctly paid on the woman. She's she's done all the work here. And, but you know, what we go through as fathers is is extraordinary. Uh, I know it's nothing like the scale of what happens to the woman and the heroic heroic nature of giving birth to a child, which is, uh, which just boggles the mind. I know I understand all that, but you, you find yourself changed as a human being and it's, finding people to talk about that with afterwards was really quite difficult. I tried to talk to my male friends who were still single and they didn't want to know about it. They no really way. Didn't, no, 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 mate, no, no. Um, uh, women friends went, well, I'm sure it was much harder for, and more profound for Kim. Yes, I know it was. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So I eventually found some friends who – we're already fathers and we had these very quiet conversations together about how it utterly changes you and changes you quite, 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 quite profoundly. And that was lovely having those conversations. Which is quite different, I imagine, than your father's generation, my father's generation who, you know, didn't, I guess, process it in the same way that I think, you know, my husband, you have, and then hopefully, you know, Joe will when he grows up and has children and all of those things. Yeah, they missed out not being present in the room. And seeing that heroic process, good God. What I want to know is once you've knocked out one, how on earth do you ever talk yourself into going back to doing it for a second time? Look, you just forget. You just think, I just am going to try to forget about that. I definitely, after my second, I was like, I I used to want four children. Yep. I walked out right. after the second and went, I okay. am never That's doing it. that. Again. Right. It's you know what you know what you know what you women are like? You're like someone who gets into a terrible, awful, grueling fist fight in a pub, right? And you're beaten up almost to death and you're thrown out of the pub and you go, I'm going back in. That's what that you're crazy to have I mean, I just don't understand where that comes from. I'm in awe of it. It's an extraordinary thing to watch. Oh God, how lovely. How lovely it is. How lovely. When it goes well, it's it is it is completely lovely. You have birthed another baby of sorts, which of course is another book. Book. Um, you know, you, you developed a process writing the other books that normally begins with some sort of adventure. Mm-hmm. You go somewhere. You you went with Kari that you wrote um, Saga Land with to Iceland. You know, you mentioned your son, Joe. How did you do this new book when you couldn't go anywhere? We had COVID. Exactly. Exactly. I plan to write another book entirely, but would require me to go to that place and have a kind of an adventure there. And then COVID struck and that made it impossible. And I had just signed a two book deal with Harper Collins, and, <laughs> and <laughs> I thought, what am I going to do now? And I started to, and also it meant that I was kind of at a loss because I actually love writing, and I felt like, oh, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, travellers, we can't travel, so what about medieval travellers? Oh, look at the Vikings. Let's see, what about the Vikings who went to Eastern Europe? I, I, and I found an account of the Vikings in in Russia, written by an Arab traveller by the name of Ibn Fadlan who was sent on a message, a diplomatic mission by the caliph in Baghdad, al-Muqtadir, in the year, in the 932 AD, I think it was, CE, to go up into what is now Russia to make a deal with the king up there. And I found his account of this voyage. When he went up there into Russia, he, he, he went through this kind of heart of darkness journey uh, into this strange and very, very cold a terrifying place. And he was a real total... Ibn Fadlan was this incredible urbanite. He lived in the biggest and richest city in the world, which was then Baghdad. And he was a, quite a man of refined taste. He was like an inner city cafe latte drinking <laughs> person who is forced to go out to, I don't know, central Queensland essentially. And 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 then he's forced to rely on the hospitality of the locals. So it's a bit like, like Wake in Fright in that sense, Kelly, too. And, and his account is kind of but turns quite un. un, un Unwittingly funny because he's just shocked by all the bogans he's running into all the time, <laughs> but but then he arrives in this in this place and he has something like a nervous breakdown in in on the Volga River, and then a party of Vikings arrive, and they're there to sell, sell animal skins, and then the chieftain dies, and after the chieftain of the Vikings dies, they go to his slaves, and they say, "Which one of you wants to die with your master?" And this slave girl puts her hand up. And in Ibn Fadlan's account of her sacrifice, the sacrifice of this woman, is one of the most harrowing things I've ever read in my life. 
one of the weirdest things as well. Um, it reads very plausibly. I find it. I, I think it's a reliable account of what happened to this woman. It it makes your hair stand on end, and the means by which the ritual, the rite by which she meets her death. I think that anyone who took part in that travelled right out to the furthest realms of human existence. So having read this enthralling account, I thought, well, what other medieval accounts are there of people going out of Baghdad, which was, like I said, the biggest and richest city in the world? And it turns out there are so many. There are so many. The people in that in the golden age of Islam loved to travel. They were mad for travel, obsessed with travel, going out to the furthest reaches of the world, to China, to our southern, the east coast of Africa, to Western Europe, to Russia, to all over the world, and writing accounts of what they saw there and the people they met. These tales, these sailors' tales and travellers' tales were the inspiration for the voyages of Sinbad, the sailor, and they gave shape and form to the Thousand and One Nights, that great, amazing compendium of stories, sometimes known as the Thousand and One Arabian Nights as well. So I found this trove of stories, these travel stories, that were wonderful, like enthralling traveling, travel stories. One guy who goes all the way out west looking, it's, sorry, to the northeast of the world looking for, he's told to go and look for the wall of Gog and Magog, which they, medieval Christians, Muslims, and Jews all believe this existed. It was a metal wall built by Alexander, of the, Great, Alexander the Great in ancient times to hold back these apocalypse beasts somewhere into the badlands of the northeast of the world, these monsters that were going to overrun the world in the apocalypse. And it seems, I mean, we can't know this for sure, but it seems he, he went there and came and said, yeah, I saw, I saw it. And he writes an account of the wall. And it seems instead he went to the westernmost reaches of the Great Wall of China, <laughs> uh, which is wonderful. I've got accounts of coins from the Arabic kingdom of Kilwa, uh, the Muslim kingdom of Kilwa on the, in East Africa near Zanzibar that fetched up in an island off the coast of Arnhem Land. Marchinbar Island. I mean, the way the links and the breadth of the land, the world that these people travelled is astonishing. Well, it's it's an amazing book. It looks beautiful. The Book of Roads and Kingdoms. I miss working with you. This has been such a lovely hour of time. It it's has been um, too long since we've seen each other with COVID and various other things. Yes, this has been a very good interview. Don't get too good at this caper, Reardon. <laughs> Because you want to take my coming job, you. you'll be coming, coming at, at me. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Oh, so that Kelly Ridden's very good as an interviewer, you know. No, I don't want that in my life. I don't need that, Ridden. Uh, you didn't think you were going to live past 30, you know, when you wrapped up your, your sort of work in comedy and you thought you'd never work in TV again. And then and now might, I'm 107. And now you're 107 and you might not have the best track record for predicting your future, but <laughs> is there anything next for Richard Feidler in this kind of, you know, career of nine lives? More that travel, had? Kelly. I've got a lot of places I haven't been to in the world. I want to travel to them if it's possible and see what happens. Oh, there's a there's a place I've got my eye on in Africa at the moment. I don't know if I can get there, uh, but there's a specific place in the lower reaches of the Nile I want to get to. Uh, you know, I don't know, like again, if I can go to go there, but um, I'll, I will I will I'll, I'll give it a red hot go, Kel. Congratulations on the book. It is magnificent. Thank you so much for coming on Curveball. It's been an absolute pleasure, Kelly Reed, and thank you. What an absolute hoot to wrap this season of Curveball with my podcasting mate, Richard Feidler. It's all come full circle to uh, to start working with him back on Conversations in 2005 and now to have him here on Curveball. Such good fun. Curveball's made by an excellent team at Deadset Studios. I'd really like to thank Grace Pashley, Liam Reardon, Travis Vettier, Anne Chesterman, Rachel Fountain and all our sound designers for their hard work this season. Thanks also to Tim Madden for our show artwork, Monique Ross for help with our LinkedIn newsletter and Matt Liddy for the work on our website, curveballshow.com. And look, there's lots of great interviews across three seasons of Curveball now. So if you've missed any episodes, make sure you go back and download them. And look, share it with a friend. Make sure you recommend this show to somebody because that really helps us grow Curveball. And look, also, I just want to thank you. We do this show for our audience. We love the feedback that we get from you each season. And so I really appreciate you being on the Curveball journey with me. 
And if you're looking to make a podcast, maybe your organisation has a story to tell or maybe wants to use podcasts as a way to communicate a message, do get in touch with us. You can email us at hello at deadsetstudios.com. 